Um, my name's Ant Healy from APRA, and it's our privilege um, to present this session in association with the Screen Composers Guild of New Zealand, a newly formed body. Marshall and Bobby are here from the Screen Composers Guild. So any composers, anyone that wants to talk to our Screen Composers Guild, they're around. Um, so please look them out. Um, and it is our pleasure to present this session um, and to welcome one of Australia's most acclaimed film and screen composers, certainly not just film, but very active in other areas of screen composing as well. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have him here, Cesare Skubaszewski. Because my, as you can see, I've got quite strong accent, so if you've got any problem with understanding what I'm going to say, uh, you could, uh, oh, you just leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't hesitate to uh, lift your hand, and I'll be very happy to explain or repeat my uh, sentence again. Because I think it's very important that I share some of my experiences and, uh, and the way I work, or it's, and the way I have some. How great other composers work. How the great composers work. So, uh, now, uh, to start the whole thing, uh, I would like to, to make a statement that the, the, the film music is a very special thing because it combines, uh, when you've got a picture and, then, and you combine this with the music, it becomes something very new, which is called the score. It's a new entity. And it's, it's not the music by itself and not the picture by itself, but it becomes the, what is called the score. And people uh, very often try to uh, analyze and they say, oh, this music can't be heard uh, just on the CD or whatever. This is irrelevant in the, in the sense when you work on the picture, because that's the maybe later on or, uh, rewards the film composer can get if the film is released on the CD or whatever. The main thing is, how the music and pictures, how this new entity formed by the pictures and the music sound, or they work together. And uh, through my own, uh, ex my experience was that I wasn't as lucky as most of you. I wasn't really trained to write music for the films, but I was lucky that on the first, uh, but I was trained as a musician. <coughs> And, uh, but very lucky that my first experience was a film uh, called Lillian's Story, which was directed by uh, the Polish director Jerzy uh, Domaratsky, and the film starring Tony Collette. And uh, he came up from the famous Wood School in Poland, and he started together with Polanski and uh, Kieślowski and Biden and whatever. And by working on this first score, he really taught me how to approach at least, that's, you know, he really squeezed me, squeezed the best out of me, and uh, and to how to approach to work on, on the film. But uh, I will show you during the session today the, the fragments of the films, and and some with some fragments which could be uh, relevant to what I'm saying. And I would also uh, be glad to show you some of the uh, scores actually, uh, how they look uh, when they they, they print. In my early days, I used to uh, write scores that was just before the, the, the computer technology hit on. And I must say that uh, one of the, uh, my earlier films, called Two Hands, was the, probably the first film in Australia I recorded on, the, on Pro Tools. Uh, so uh, why I'm saying this, because I was uh, always interested in the technology as well as uh, um, obviously keeping the, the interest in the acoustic and real instruments. But definitely I've never been a purist. I've never been searching for some, something always good to find something new in the stuff I'm doing. Occasionally I succeeded. That's my honest response. Uh, uh, but that's the, probably the happiest moments in my life when I work on the film, that I can one occasionally surprise myself and uh, and come up with something good, and then I feel really the life is wonderful. So, uh, I will play a first fragment of the film. Uh, it's from the film called Night, 
And this is just the, the simplest example of how the music works with the picture. It's not, uh, this is actually the music and the picture work together. It's, uh, it was a documentary film initially uh, with the idea of uh, uh, being constructed to be just music and pictures, and then later on the director sort of uh, started introducing some dialogue, which uh, I suppose it helped to a certain degree the, the narrative of the film. This is uh, why I'm playing, uh, going to play this fragment, because this is the opening scene from the film. And when I work on the film score, the, for me, my, my uh, process is like that. that usually when I, uh, in the case when I'm, when I'm working on the film, that film is already finished, <coughs> then I look at the film, or even unfinished uh, rough uh, cut, and then I look through the film, and then I go to the piano wherever and I think about writing a music without looking at the pictures. I want to write music for the film, to get the sense of the feeling of the film. And to me, the opening of the generally first sequence of the film, of any film I see, from my point of view as a viewer, is so important because how you assess the quality of the film. Uh, when I go to the movies, uh, when I look, look at the opening credits, and if they've got music or not, but the quality of the cinematography, and uh, how is the whole end, first three, four minutes of the film handled, I can very, usually, without exception, uh, uh, make a form, a form of opinion how good the film is. Maybe the, the, the script could fail later on and so on, but the quality of the film has to be uh, indicated, I think, right at the beginning. This is the, uh, so sometimes, the time passes by, and I still haven't come up with the right idea of the main theme of the film, but I still keep calm because I know once I have this together, the rest will flow very easy. And I think it's a very important moment to have this focal point. It's like for the script writer, what, where the story goes, and for the, the, the film composer actually to have something which represents the, the which will represent the film, the, the, the heart of the film. Okay, I play this first. Uh, there's a two reasons why I'm playing this because the, I want to show how the, this film night started, but I also want to, to show you that it mainly because it's quite impressive piece of music. I, <laughs> I one day I just wrote it very quickly and orchestrated it very quickly, uh, supporting stuff. I went to uh, record this film score with Polish National Symphony Orchestra in, in Poland. And I, start, I went for three days to record 60 minutes of music and with full orchestra. It was, I would never do it again. It was, it was really, the first thing I got a jet lag after flying there. And when we were recording, I didn't like anything because I was so tired. <laughs> and then I, only when I came back, I realized it's quite, some of it is really good. Oh, some of it is good. And, uh, uh, but anyway, I, at the, at the opening session of this, I started, I introduced this piece because traditionally I always want to start with the opening music of the film. This is my superstition. I always, first cue in the recording session, I want to start with my, the main theme of, of the film. Now, but the problem with this film was that the, the main theme is very fast and there was middle of the winter in Poland, snow, and they didn't play took us a long time to, to really warm up to the, the, this run. To this degree that they had after, on the end of the third day, I got them to play again. And by then the brass section was gone, but that was the much better version after they played really well. So actually, at the end, I, I ended up in not using the film, the full orchestral version, but just the version with the strings and percussion. Okay, let's find this here. Not all the stuff is as good. Look, the whole idea is that to write, it's amazing because to write with the, the endless line, relentless, like because I talked about that when you've got the, when you've got the storm coming and you want to finish and it's never finishing. That's why I wanted this the continuous melody because usually composition is played that it's in phrases, whatever, and this phrase never ends. And actually my dream is to write this like a one hour composition which never repeats it, you just keep forcing and forcing and forcing. But how much, you know, the ideas you have, because it's so easy to always come back to more after a while, 
to a more comfortable uh, thing. And, and, and what a great thing is that usually all the best things I've written, they've been written very fast, they're very quickly. It's an idea. And then I'll probably spend a lot of time correcting and orchestrating this. I can show you very briefly how they were. Would you like to see the, the score? Yes. Uh, okay, I will uh, uh, just chart. Um, oh, that's the first page. That's just to give you indication uh, how that was. So, can you see? I started with the. the I'm using to the all elements because, like, in, in a way, it was written in triplets. And also, uh, I must say that to get the really uh, right uh, the right of, of strings playing different parts, I, I uh, uh, got uh, to help me with orchestration the uh, violinists. Not someone who specializes in orchestration, whatever, but very good violinists because I wanted to get all the right voices, because I want to spread, spread all the voices. So some of the orchestra was playing in triplets, some of the orchestra was playing in 4-4 four, four time, so, so I was creating more and more sort of counter melodies, but generally everyone was supporting this just one continuous line, but if I just did everyone playing in unison, it would be boring, because it would be just this mass of the sound. But, but as you can see, I left some, some parts of the, violin, the second violins out, and I go to the next stage, next page, and then, and and you can see, and then I would bring sort of little waves of the of the second and the, violin, <coughs> the violins coming in triplets, and then disappearing, and then something coming back in four four again in very steadily. So I create the waves moving behind. Not all of the waves, as I said, they end up in the in the full recording because that was just. I end up with the, what you just heard is the recording just with, with most of the string orchestra. And I also had a, a part written for tubular bells. But the, the problem in this recording session was that it's the, one of the funniest things ever happened to me. That actually they, the, the percussionist who was booked to do to, uh, on the session, he couldn't reach some of the tubular bells. <laughs> so uh, really, this is a true story. We had, we had to get to fetch this, uh, like, uh, chairs for him to walk and play. I never came across this, but it was like a sort of from Fellini movie, you know. Like, uh, you know, they're getting percussions, you can't uh, reach this instrument. So, uh, 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 that was quite good. He uh, said I was so tired, as I said, I didn't like the joke. And then, and then I said to, the, and then I said to the, the, the first violinist, I said, this, this chair is really old. <coughs> You know, it's a beautiful woman, and he said, I know, she's my wife. <laughs> that, that didn't go well as well. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I try to be friendly and uh, give you some of the, the bounce back. But as you can see, so I kept just thinking the, 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 the structure of the whole thing as the, 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 the score was progressing, and then I was bringing the, the, all the, uh, the, the violas. Because that was a big orchestra, so I couldn't afford to do the uh, you know, the, the, the verities or the split the strings the way I wanted and to pump all the cellos and, 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 and violins on the bottom as strong as possible. You know, I had like eight, uh, I think I had cellos, you know, section, that's quite good. Mind you, you know, the big American films, they use 16 uh, uh, cello sections, which obviously uh, is out of question with our budgets and, and, and uh, but that, uh, not necessary more is not necessary uh, better. Uh, and I had a, a situation that uh, on, on two recording sessions I had to ask actually how of the double basses not to play because it was just too heavy automate, as they say. So suddenly so I paid these people for sitting and doing nothing. Okay, but I think it was better, better for the project. <laughs> okay. And then the last last page when it just goes to the percussive part. And as you can see, I had the, 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 the horns and trumpets and whatever coming with the, with the, the stops to, to intensify the whole thing. And again, with the percussion stuff, I just wanted really one, not masses of percussion coming, but to record one percussion, but very well. Because I believe that, you know, if you don't, if you keep just sort of dubbing stuff, and you, things will cancel each other. So I just we work on the sound of this particular percussion and just we went harder and harder and harder. Means when you record the timpani actually 
playing hard, that doesn't mean better, because I don't know if that's shared this experience for you, but probably most of you study music, but uh, actually to get the best sound on the timpani, you don't have to hit hard, you have to know where to hit. And uh, I don't know, translates to all sorts of music. I remember seeing uh, videos of ACDC and the drummer sitting with this huge sound and him just sitting very loud, but he knew when to hit. It was so hard and heavy. So that's what I mean. Finding is not, the, not necessarily the answer, but it feels good when you do it. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, we're moving uh, uh, ahead. Look, the, the, the music uh, have uh, obviously very different forms, and uh, in uh, and we're we'll talking in particular about film music because uh, there are different uh, ways of uh, approaching writing when you work on the feature film and the advertising, which I've done in the past quite a bit, and television drama. Uh, you know, in television, as I've just said recently in the interview here, the, in, in the film, the relationship between film director and the composer is extremely important because you, uh, how, you, you, how you create, I think, requires an intimacy and understanding uh, on both parts, because not all the directors are uh, very musical. For, to, to some directors, music is the most important thing, apart from the you know the, the script. Just uh, uh, two days ago, I, I had on ABC Radio in Australia uh, interview with Giuseppe Tornadore, the director of Cinema Paradiso, and he made nine films with Erico, uh, Erio Marconi. There is music, and he said, the first thing after the script is written, they send the, the script to Ennio Morricone, the poster, uh, who is someone who, who you could know, Ennio Morricone is a great Italian composer known for uh, <coughs> the mission and the, all the spaghetti westerns, to them in the past, they like, very talented and very influential music composer. And, uh, Giuseppe Tornadore said, then we send the music, then I want my music to be recorded before we start shooting the film. I couldn't believe I was driving a car. And then he said, next. Uh, and next thing, he said, I want to, uh, uh, and then I said, I will never cut the film to the demo track. I will only cut the, the, my movie to the finished music track. Another example I can give you of the great Polish uh, film director Kieślowski, and he did the same technique because uh, I worked on a film with his DOP, uh, Slava Milijak, who did uh, Three Colors Red and uh, Gataka, which was a great film, in American film, and, and the, uh, worked on the, uh, the Halok films. And he said again, Kieślowski always wanted uh, bigger prize to, to compose music first. So he could cut and actually compose the scenes in the film to the rhythm of the music, not other way around. This is as good as it can get, uh, and hardly ever. So, so you can dream about it. You know, the real stuff is the car. You know, it is that. You know, I've been lucky in a few situations that they, I've been uh, actually because of the, the nature of the film, I've been invited to write music for the, uh, for the dancing before the, the film was shot. And actually, actually I show you this uh, interesting thing here. You'll be first in the world to see it, because I never showed to anyone. I worked on this film, a uh, uh, Armstrong film, The Divine Acts, and I had to, uh, I, and I had to uh, work with Catherine Zeta Jones, who was in London, and I was in my, Beach house in near Wilson from a tree. And we were, and she was, we were working on the dancing sequences. And I was getting this. I was, she would send me this video with her dancing, and, and, and we were improving on certain pieces. So I will just show you this example of a piece at work. Okay. As you can see, the young girl is, has become very famous since. She is, Ron, Ronan, I guess. She's uh, been in many films, including in New Zealand, I think. 
Uh, and then I played with this scene. So a lot of what is what she was cutting at the beginning, because we were working out the timings for different movements. So instead of me uh, uh, writing music and then her dancing to my music, actually they the the English choreographer wanted me to write music to what they wanted to be. So so the same scene when I finished with this looked like that. So, uh, look, this is easy stuff in a way, but it's time consuming. Because obviously the music I haven't discovered in it in this uh, soundtrack, I had to create the music which sort of has got Middle Eastern, Gypsy influenced and so on. One <laughs> good idea is very easy when you live in a city like Melbourne or Sydney to pull this thing together because there's a lot of exotic musicians happy to play. Except over the years, I've learned one thing that actually, when you get uh, uh, what is called ethnic musicians specializing in music, they're very, not very flexible in, in adjusting to the original music. And uh, I end up usually recording music like that with my set of musicians who are very versatile and they, they can cover all the stuff. Because usually, when you get the uh, you know particular men from you know known from some and exotic ensemble of some ethnic music, they will just play their the music fantastically well, but when you put them in the different situation, they don't feel comfortable and they can't stretch out. Uh, probably the, 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 the most interesting was when I was working on the film The Sound of One Can Clapping, the film's with producer actually we are very privileged to have here, the role they here. So uh, we, uh, I used the uh, uh, instrument Santo, which was instrument because when I was working on the film, I wanted to have instruments which can combine most of the European countries, because the film was about migrants coming from Europe, and also to bring the Celtic element to the whole thing, because obviously it was dealing with the immigration to Australia. And I realized that this film Santo, which is the different names, is used uh, is, uh, right across Europe by the, the, uh, by, uh, as a different instrument, played you know, with strings with the little, little uh, sticks, uh, actually can create all, all this stuff. And why I'm saying this, because when I worked with this musician, and it was very intelligent man, very, very good musician, but he thought all my harmonic aesthetics combined with his playing was just saying, it was so wrong. He couldn't hear the same. I realized we, we had different music. It was just quite amazing. Uh, but he was intelligent enough to go and uh, to be guided by me the way I wanted to. And I was very happy with his playing. <laughs> On this particular situation, I, I don't want to be really like, uh, I just, uh, I've learned from him as much as he has learned from me. You know, let's be fair. Uh, uh, so, uh, it goes like that. Now, the, <coughs> brings me to this, because I just end up here talking about the music, the, the, the pre-recorded music before, uh, the film being started. Sometimes uh, the situation appears that actually the temp music for the dancing is put already there and then later on the uh, uh, director or the producers uh, can't uh, realize they can't afford to buy this truck. And, 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 how, and I've done with this on a few occasions. And as two of you and most of you are musicians, I would uh, give you advice. First thing, you just copy the tempo track which means like if the music is played live, obviously tempo varies. So you sit down and just on the computer, divide this into one or two bar sections and just follow all the tempo changes. And once the tempo is changes, you can uh, write any piece of music you want to because it will fit in with all the uh, ch uh, movement of the body. This is again, the same can go, I've learned over the years, the same with sometimes writing music to the tempo track. People get used to very often to the temp track. For you who don't understand what the temp track is, I will explain. The temp track is a very bad thing. <laughs> it's a really bad for the, for the composer. is just the, mainly because it's written usually by very talented people. And, <laughs> and, and, the, and, and, and the, the worst is that people who go to the field get used to the temp track. That's, I give you the example though to the degree. So the third track for you, the, I'll just make it clear, is that when people make editing of the film, 
the editors, especially the editors, and they obviously the directors, they put the, any music they want to, to just to make the flow, the, 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 the scenes flow, and the, 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 the film have uh, some rhythm, because everything in life, in the film and everything, and with great editor, everything has to have rhythm. And the, the music helps this rhythm to go through the changes with, with great editing. And there was a case in the film of, of Mel in Melbourne about 10 years ago, eight years ago, then when they, there was very famous American composer, really one of the most famous was uh, um, asked to write music, was commissioned, and at the same time they were using the ten track from another American film by another composer to the degree when this commissioned composer delivered the score, they got rejected and they bought whole score from already existing film because there was nobody, because they described, oh, he sent this music but was just lying there, was doing nothing. And that's very interesting description of the film, you could make, of, the, of, the, of the music for the film. You can make great film, uh, create great track, but will be just sitting there, you know? If it doesn't help, it's better not to have music. Uh, so that's as bad things can go. In America, this thing is called cloning. Apparently, according to the, uh, the people who try, the, sometimes directors are push the composers to write something similar and they clone particular ideas. Obviously, the most famous one was the American Beauty, that everyone, every suddenly there was a period of five years that every film I got had the temp track from American Beauty by this talented uh, <coughs> guy, Newman, and, uh, and then uh, Thomas Newman, and then uh, who is really very good, and also uh, with Matrix, apparently was cloned 350 times. In 350 American films, the idea of Matrix score was combining this heavy drumming with the, the symphony orchestra. Talking about heavy drumming, which has got nothing to do with this, I will show you an example uh, of the, another idea of, so, so that's what I did you. I just finished this thing. So I've learned that if some scenes which were particular rhythms of editing, and they use temp track, particular temp track, I will copy the tempo of the temp track. I will usually musically try to go other way around so they can't com com I can't compete. Can't compete. The, the idea is if you try to do something similar, it will be always worse. It will be never as good. And the same with advertising, whatever. You, you hear this all the time. So idea is to copy the tempo of the track, of the temp track, because subconsciously the director and the editor, they every and the producers, they all got used to that something flows a certain way. They don't even know it. They don't even understand this intellectually. But it's just they know that something flows. And when you put the music, which you got the same rhythm and so on, it will, uh, doesn't matter, it could be very different music, but it will really uh, fit to the, to the picture. Because you see, remember, everything has to have this rhythm in, 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 in the film. Talking, uh, after, uh, I've got this example of the, uh, another film uh, which I worked, which was uh, Anna Kokino's film, uh, which uh, brings an, uh, one of the, uh, another ideas of how you write the score. In this particular film, I follow the, 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 uh, this concept that the, actually music only comes between the scenes in the film and actually is not never competing is with the dialogue and, and uh, plays like a transitionary uh, in, in transitions from scenes to scenes which are sometimes quite long and uh, uh, you know involve some contemplation so uh, now I decided so we will decide, it obviously not I decided, I, Anna Kokinos wanted uh, to have a particular piece of music and then very quickly we realized that if I have the same composition and I keep just repeating, but again there's a development of the music in a sense of arrangement but not actually melody, we're going on the journey. This uh, not, not you know, brand, brand new idea 
And uh, so I decided actually also the film had very low budget. And so I decided that I wrote this uh, chord progression, very simple. It's, it's a minimalist music here, we're talking yes. about. And I wrote chord progression, and I have a good string section, and I wrote two parts so they get overdone. The whole session took one and a half hours <laughs> of string section. I, they all agreed to get uh, even be being paid a bit less than for normal three hour session. But, but everything was done legally and so on. <laughs> and we recorded this over, so I had this sound, I had 32 musicians, came for one and a half hours, we recorded it twice, so it was sounding like, they didn't record the same part, they recorded twice, so it sounded bigger, and I had this minimalistic, like, I suppose, uh, uh, tradition that you had a simple chord progression, which I will show you here, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in repeat, rep repeating, but at the same time, always changing. It was, so that's as, as simple as it was, as you can see, the very uh, simple uh, chords, but it's just by changing of the voicing, I was moving the whole thing at the, at the head. This, why am I mentioning this? Because this score gave me huge satisfaction because of two reasons. One, that I created something uh, that I always liked the idea that it's one thing holds whole thing together. Once I was asked to uh, talk about French film music, and uh, I agreed that I had to do a lot of research, and then I uh, uh, realized that in the film uh, uh, Betty Blue, which was a huge hit with fantastic score, the opening cue is repeated 27 times. <laughs> yes, but and, and never feels bad, you know? And that's what I, and I thought, I will try this. And I'm so happy with this. Obviously, not everyone felt like that. I didn't get an award for that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, they don't know good things. You know? <laughs> I will catch one, you know, I will find them one after the other, these people from the jury. <laughs> so, uh, it's a long journey. <laughs> so, uh, and the, uh, the score, if I play the piece, the, the, the score again. So, it's just simply, um, this is like written nearly like a score. For quartet, with uh, not quartet because I was studying violas uh, uh, and so on, uh, and then uh, so just sustain chords and, and keep. But then again, I, I kept moving this progression more and more. I also written uh, then another multiple speed stuff based on the same progression on the piano. As you can see, this piano is just played not just for two hands, but it's just played for. It's more or less had to be played by two hands because of the complexity of it. Not complexity of the notes, but to keep the flow. But to me, just normal piano was just not enough. So what I did, I played the piano, but I also played synthesizer dubbing the piano. So it made it sort of, you can't hear synthesizer, but it's just something a bit more, more, more tense than just normal piano. I didn't want it to be pure. And as I was writing this, the best thing came out that I asked the flute player to play this repetition, re, re, repetitive melody. And that doesn't mean it just was flute, you know, that flute is flute. That wasn't good enough again. So I compressed this flute electronically so much that it sounds like nothing, you, it's like you think it's synthesized. I mean, maybe it's like going back, but it's somehow you will hear that the sound is quite uh, original. I'll tell you the, 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 this too. This is closing of the film, but actually combines m most the ideas I've been talking uh, in this film about. Uh, also, uh, there's a uh, what need for the percussive instrument, and I uh, originally I recorded with the real percussion, and again it sounded too normal, it sounded too organic for the anger of the film. So actually, I program uh, the, the percussion myself on the computer. So here we go. This is just an example of how good I did, you know, in my opinion. It gave me satisfaction because I could experiment with the sound of the flute. I, got, you know, I just was fiddling around with the, the compressor on my, in my studio and suddenly I got the sound of this flute, which I, it made me very happy. And again, I did the same piece and I started introducing new chords or whatever, the whole thing would be destroyed because I kept the emotion within inside as the pictures were showing instead of letting emotion just dictate the, the, 
of the music. So you could feel some depth in the emotional tension that um, emotion manipulating the viewer. So, to the degree we always do, but that's another story. Uh, uh, now, the, uh, the music could be very uh, obviously used uh, for, for different uh, purposes in a way in the film. My, obviously, to me the biggest satisfaction is when the music is bringing another element, another color to the film. If the film is good, you really really need uh, extra music uh, to uh, magnify the elements of the score because you know it, it should go by it on its own. But but not always because, like I said, some of the picture with combination with music they create another dimensional uh, level. And sometimes you create something which is really perfect. I give you this another example with again repetitious chord progression, but bringing something creating, it's not ex as exposed as here. This is from Phil Lillian's story. When I wrote this repetitious chord progression, but it gets building bigger and bigger. And after the two runs through the, the progression, I started with uh, just with cellos, then I brought the violas, then I brought the uh, first and second strings, then I brought brass and woodwind, <coughs> and then at the end, huge choir. It's not dominating the picture because this is one of the probably the best scenes of any film I worked on is from uh, the from Lillian's story, opening sequence in Lillian's story, when Ruth Krachner, an Australian actress, is uh, reciting the uh, Richard III. This is shot by the Slavomir Lijak. To me, the composition of the picture when you've got the actress reciting the pictures with my music in the background. And the, but she's behind the window, so actually you don't have this, the contact with her is not immediate, yes, because she's separated from us. I think creates this very interesting tension in the film right from the beginning. And also the fact that she, uh, I, I thought it was very, it's very important fact that's also that Slavo Menijak's uh, cinematography is, uh, he uses, on this film he was using 13 lenses. So when I was getting the film, initially, I could see nothing. You know, it was just red. Then a week later, I would start seeing some silhouettes because they were grad grading it down from completely saturation of the, uh, of the filters. And, uh, and, and I liked this because it was sort of like I was slowly discovering the film as I was progressing with writing the music. But I, I hope you will like this scene. And even the music is not uh, as prominent, but I think it gives very important emotion element, it gives another emotion element to the, this uh, uh, picture. Very well shot. So the idea is that here, like you see the really very uh, contemporary clusters in France by you know, French Polish composer Penderecki, uh, and it's like a dissonant 12 half part harmony in some parts, it's giving the, just the splashes of this sort of uh, tension uh, building up in, in this scene. As an opposite to the whole thing, for example, so this is like a big sound supporting the, 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 the picture, giving the idea of uh, emotional uh, background and just complementing the picture, but in sort of grander sort of uh, uh, way. Uh, I will, uh, I'll show you something completely opposite. I always show in my presentation. From the film The Sound of One Hand Clapping, I always show this thing when uh, this is one scene which combines, one, one cue which combines few things, scenes, and I'm the just simple piano actually leading us to the, all the changes happening in the sequence of the film. Uh, even more so, the, there's a score section when the sound effects and the foley is taken out, that the music just the piano by itself, with complete silence, creates this amazing uh, focus on what's, uh, on the emotion of on this particular scene. Because, in my opinion, uh, you know that this obviously the story in every film is important, but the, the films are made out of scenes. And I think as years pass by, we probably remember the scenes from the film much more than the film itself or the stories itself. The certain scenes will always stay with us for life forever, and with 
without us remembering exactly uh, even the, 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 the film. And uh, I remember one shooting interview with the Coen brothers, and then they said that they write the script, actually just writing scene after scene, and whatever the next day sit down and whatever the idea will come. So they actually sometimes start writing scripts without having the original idea when the film will end up, as, as far as the narrative of it. So uh, here is the, the sound of the clapping scene. So look, I always love this somehow, the, 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 the scene, and uh, it sounds so, so few, a little bit fewer. And uh, again, if I play this on the beautiful uh, Steinway Grand Piano, it would be bad. I had to find the piano sort of medium quality with all European sound, because if I play on a beautiful concert piano, the whole thing would be just too pretentious and not pretentious. So actually, creating the right sound is so important, and uh, with the, as, as, as I get older, so I, I realize they, 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 they focus on the sound, and also this collaboration between the, the sound and the sound designer uh, allow, uh, is so important, and probably it's not enough in the film production, actually the composer talking with the sound designer. This is the first year actually I watched the television series uh, uh, that's a big, big fan of it. And then I, uh, even I work on a few. And uh, I watched a Danish series called The Bridge and The Killing. And uh, the quality of the sound design and the, the, the music is like a ballet that they, they never in each other way, especially in The Bridge, which is sort of probably shouldn't be for 13 episodes because of uh, the, the dragging the story. But when the music comes, the sound goes away. And it's just sort of like, I felt jealous. I felt jealous that there were people who could sort of, so easy to, it was like a, a scene moving between sound design and the, the music. It was really, and the, 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 the sound was very contemporary, it was because of the, it was giving this feeling of the cold, uh, Danish sort of, uh, uh, big city feeling. And, uh, but it somehow, it really worked, you know, somehow it worked, uh, uh, very well. I'm working on the film and we, I, I was trying to, again, to combine the, the and I got this permission to use this uh, little fragment of the film I'm still finishing, uh, and this is actually the combination of the, how the sound design, which is unfinished, and they're actually using the spaces it can work in the, in the film. Uh, uh, the balance between the music and sound design and whatever. Look, I could play a lot of beautiful tunes, but I'm trying to explain to you how the really the nitty gritty works because I can keep drawing up, you know, my, you know, top my favorite tw twenties uh, and showing who how how many lovely tunes I, I wrote. But that's not the point of this meeting. I wanted to to see how it really works. And and being honest, it is sometimes very hard to to, to find this balance. To uh, and 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 sometimes. I write something I'm very happy with. I never sent to the, the, the director, or never showed the director something I'm really happy with. But they came with the directors, you know, uh, could, uh, you know, could uh, have a bad day or whatever. So if you really believe you're in your tune, there's one director sitting here, but I will, I will tell you, leave it for two weeks and just present it again. And maybe they will like it second time. Because it's, it's, everything is so, it, it's so fragile, really, it, the, the decision making of these things. And, and, and people sometimes have a bad day or hangover or whatever. I remember I was missed meeting Lillian's story and then the director flew back from Europe for the mix. And, and he had jet lag and he was sleeping in the studio. Every time he woke up, said, music is too loud. And he woke up and said, I really wanted to go. And, the, the, and the, that, the, that music being so soft in the mix, but somehow it worked. He was somehow right, you know, in, the, in this little way. He, but he said this like five, uh, five times, and then the, the best line he ever came up with. Like, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to swear at the university thing, but he said to me once, because we, we, he was a Polish director, and we called it, it said, Mister, all the true, they're all making, you know, the, the good European tradition. So he was never Cesare or Jurek only. Mr. Skubiszewski, yeah. 
and was uh, and he came to me once and he said, Mr. Skrzyszewski, what is this fucking violin doing there? <laughs> <laughs> I never forget this uh, such a beautiful night. I will always keep reminding him. Now we talk to each other about you. But, uh, I think it was just classic. Uh, so, uh, but he was like, so serious and so upset about this. Um, so I tell you this: this is a, uh, uh, you know, doing the work, and it's completely unfinished, ungraded. But I wanted to show you how the, this quite horrific sequence of events. This is quite important because in this film I really went to town as far as they tried to find uh, some new colors. For example, let's start from the end. I, uh, in this last killing scene I had uh, just two instruments playing. There was only actually doing it. But they never were together. There was a percussion playing on, on the glasses, one glasses. Yeah? And, uh, uh, and then I had a Duduk, duduk, which is Middle Eastern Persian instrument, which I used right for the film, combination of duduk, but I just didn't want to make two, two Middle Eastern, so I always, then I got the clarinet play to play exactly the same noise, notes as this guy playing uh, on duduk. So it wasn't all a, a Middle Eastern, but I still wanted to make the sound very foreign to this film. And then the, the, the best part is when they start bringing this percussion, and it never repeats. It's just bringing another, just one drum with not repetitive pattern coming to the end. Actually, I had this drum starting much earlier because I thought it was a basic journey, but it was just too heavy, apparently. Uh, heavy, seems heavy. So I think I should play you something very quickly, something to cheer you up. <laughs> uh, uh, because something to make you laugh from the vibe, maybe. Uh, it's, this is fun, it starts quite heavy, but <coughs> naturally, uh, but it should be good, yeah. This is one of the finest things. It is, again, I will explain to you, a few things about this film. Uh, uh, I, uh, I was, this is a section, uh, there, there were two sounds I created for film Two Hands, Greg and Jordan Hill, and then there, there was two concepts. When I, uh, um, when I watched film uh, uh, Dead Man, uh, uh, which was with the, the Johnny Depp film, uh, it was uh, Neil Young sit down, sit down in front of the screen and play on electric guitar with heavy delay. Uh, it, music just in one go, uh, but it, it still it was a tribute to Ennio Morricone spaghetti westerns, just taking feather in a way, like you know, because Ennio Morricone brought this electric guitar. You know, he actually was a very experimental composer in his own day, you know, and both electric pianos before anyone else and so on. And I thought, if I'm doing this film about gangsters, I will start with the gangster type of idea, to film with the big brats, but I will make it heavier. I will transfer it to a much heavier sound. So in many cues, actually, I, I, I booked this 14-piece brass session, all the heaviest players, in Melbourne play, uh, jazz players and made them to play what is called on the backfield. So everyone was playing behind the beat, so it was feeling so heavy. And I created this cluster chords, which I will show it to you. And so in a way, I wanted to, and also recorded the jazz drums, but then I, I, I transferred the recording, transfer recording to the computer, and, and I tuned it down. So everything sounded sort of a bit unrealistic slightly, it was heavier sound. And that gave me uh, this particular sound for this, uh, this film. The film, I had to create also another element of music which had to be very, what I call groovy but daggy, or daggy but groovy, which means you did felt sort of awkwardly contemporary, modern, but somehow not 100% <laughs> as cool as it should be. And I think that's what was required. I think it was just required as type of drumming and so on and so on. So, look, moments like that, I really enjoy working on this film because I, I want to say that on particular uh, films, you get the uh, things go well and everything's going well. In the recording sessions too, you can get a group of musicians, or orchestra, and, and the sound is good. 
everything sounding good. So it's the best fantastic studio, fantastic group of musicians. You write something similar in the similar key, next time you go and everything sounds not so good. <laughs> so, uh, and that's it again. Uh, idea is to be very strong in the situations like that when things don't go well in the studio to be able to turn around things. You know, it's like for the director, sometimes probably going through the crisis, but I said, we composers who create the sound of the recording, the main thing is to make people, musicians, to feel good about themselves, because then they play well. You never come to a musician and say, I don't like the way you play, because they will play three times worse, you know, because they will just go inside. Even if you don't like someone's playing, say, look, that's fabulous, why don't you try something like that? Oh, that, why don't you maybe try to uh, play something in tune? No, no, maybe, maybe that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's not it, that's like that. But I tell you, I was working on this film, The Wonder Boy, and I got like this guy, Suzuki player, this Greek sort of hero from some Greek club, you know, he was, Whoop. he played with a beautiful shirt to the studio, and that was nothing. That, and I kept correcting him, I said, play this, play, you know, I said, no, no, I want you to play. And he just suddenly put his Suzuki on the stand, and he said to me, listen, Cesare, okay, I can play your way, or we can play the groovy way. <laughs> <laughs> but I did so. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, different situations can happen. Look, I'm, I've got uh, about seven or eight minutes left of the session, and if you've got, I've got a lot of examples, as you can see, samples, but I try to be selective. And I also want to say about different ways, uh, in different role music can play in the film as well. But if you want to ask me some questions at this stage, you are welcome already. If not, I will continue. Yes? I just wanted to know what the groove was for the set bars, which is a totally different style. Yeah. Look, I've done, uh, partly I, I suppose I did the, the survive, uh, you know, I've worked on so many films because uh, I, I generally like different types of music. I think it's just good music and good, uh, bad music. And like I work on film, uh, the bootman, where I recorded heavy, you know, like a rock tr tracks and so on. And I believe that when you do this, you have to go full way with the style. Because very often classical musicians don't actually go Greek enough when they ask to do the jazz or whatever. So you have to really believe in what you do, not to do. I'm doing this because, you know, they asked me to. And look from the sort of like a, a balcony. <laughs> uh, with the, the song music on, of the country, I actually, I, many years ago, in the days where I had hair, I used to work, I used to play in, 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 in Paris, in the club. Uh, all these tracks in this, in, from yeah. the Sapphires. So I know the tracks very well. And obviously, uh, my role wasn't actually so much involved with the songs, but initially with choosing this songs, and also being involved in development of the script on certain levels as a musician. I worked with Wayne Blanford probably, we started talking about the film about two, two years before the film, uh, shoot of the film. And, uh, and, and obviously the film was evolving uh, in different ways. For me, what's most important, my, my contribution for the uh, Southwest was with the stage of actually from girls being the country music singer to soul singing, because initially in the in the script was very simplistic, and I thought, you know, that doesn't give film uh, credibility. Uh, I also I wrote the score, and uh, which is uh, to my taste not uh, loud enough. And actually, for American version, uh, Weinstein, uh, Harvey Weinstein has to a number of my cues to be lifted in the, in the, in the mix for American release, and uh, and I wrote a number of generic song music tracks, which I had fun recording. A lot of tracks were, uh, were recorded as well in the uh, uh, national Tennessee with American players to just get this really right uh, group of the song music tracks. I played the, the cue, which is, I don't know, that's another heavy uh, uh, cue I chose. Can I? Uh, from the Sabbath, because I liked it. Again, this creates the, but it's not as, nothing as heavy as the other one I played in some problem. That's maybe, I've got regrets about that one. Uh, 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 Maybe for evening session, <laughs> after dinner could be better. Uh, and so, the Southwise, here we go. This is the scene when, 
again, uh, I, can I just go back to the, 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 this previous thing uh, I, I gave? Because in, in a way, uh, in, I haven't finished actually, but my thought went, uh, moved forward. But like in the, in the two hands, at the same, in the other uh, heavy uh, thing from the, uh, the broken show I was showing to you, I combined everything, but not competing with each other. I, I use the orchestra, I use electronic instruments, I use some ethnic instruments, I use a very unusual percussion, but everything sort of to be homo is like work together to create the sound. So I wasn't, a, I just thought that the film of such a strong narrative required a bit more unusual sounding stuff than the normal. Even with some orchestral stuff, I was still putting some delay of, on strings or suddenly Actually, for, for, for this film, I got the uh, missing guy, this friend of mine from New York, because I, I, he specially worked with York. And I wanted someone like that who's got a bit more, who can twist every sound I have, so nothing would be so normal. Here, but that's not this, this film, I'm talking about the, the, the broken show. Here is the, the, the sapphires. It's one of the scenes which is actually a very confronting uh, scene. Uh, and uh, I used the, again, I used the percussion, it was the uh, I used electronic percussion. And in, in this, in the last few years, every time I use, most of the time I use this big string orchestra, I use always bass electric guitar, <coughs> just to give a bit more uh, middle range oomph, because uh, there's a very different if you use the, the classical basses and electric guitar. And, and I was very happy when I uh, went to the concert of Thomas Newman and he had that in his orchestra in between all the string players sitting bass guitar player happily <laughs> pumping this bass. I told myself I wasn't wrong with myself. And here's the film. <coughs> this is important historically cue and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the scene. Uh, look, it, I again try to uh, combine uh, this is actually, as I said, in the American release has been much louder and actually they, they, they changed the balance and took some dialogue out because they thought the music actually could push the whole thing again. I used the, this is, I've got actually a bit of a chart for it, but most importantly, you know, not, not in every clue I do, it's everything charted. Here I use the main percussion instrument, this big kick you can hear, was combined with it, one of my African drums I've got, and also I create, uh, created on electric guitar this sound which sounds very percussive but it's actually been created on electric guitar and because it sounds sort of a bit aboriginal but you can nail it down. It's always hard issue when you try to create Australian sound. You know, when you do French film, you put a bit of accordion in your life. <laughs> you just they always have that piano accordion in their films. But we we try not to be all Obvious with the digital do, and so we said it's been done a million times. We don't want to sticks. We don't want so what we do. So then you really then you've got a bit of Irish influence, but it's a really hard thing to try to create something with originality and to create still keep the Australian ambience. Uh, so uh, that's that's what for many creates that's very good for the industry in a way that, that, that people have to try a bit uh, uh, harder. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes? so, we've got about five more minutes, so maybe one more question? Yeah. Or, yeah. One more question? Okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what are the issues uh, that you've come across with sort of uh, probably younger, more low budget sort of stuff that you often worked on for at least a probably very long time, um, is the edit changing after the, a lot of composition work has been done? Uh, and having to change, like say, in things where the composition has been done and tight timing can be edited, uh, if changes can happen subsequent to that. I was just wondering if you've ever had any experiences of having to change, of an edit changing after you've uh, done a reasonable amount of composition work on it. No, funny you're asking, just, I'm in the middle of that. I just thought that the, 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 the broken show, I thought I finished. And my engineer went back to New York, and then I had a meeting with the director, and he said, oh, he didn't ask me to change any cues, but he suddenly asked me to do many new cues. 
And I suddenly, <laughs> and I thought I finished the film, you know, then making work on the film, and I realized that I've got about another, you know, 10 minutes of music to compose and, and create. But that's not the, look, there are changes, especially with the, the digital technology. The film is never finished anymore, but as, that's what you're saying. When you had the film on cellular, there was a always point of the lock-off. Now, lock-off is an abstract term. The lock-off, you know, I never forget, I, was, I, I went with Julian Armstrong on Death Defying Act, and I stayed a one month at the lock-off to fixing up little things, and then I'm in the south of France, you know, surrounded by very fashionable people, sitting in the cafe, and I'm receiving the call from Julian Armstrong, where the hell are you? He said, I want the key to be for change. I had to go had to Nice to find a studio and change the queue. Because this never, never sort of, uh, that's what, they, what the digital technology change. You know, you can make, uh, for the film is great, you can make 30, uh, 30 takes of one scene, for example, which is fantastic as well. So, but for the composer to be, well, because you, you can never be sure when actually the film is finished. I've been in the situation that the film is locked off, sealed off, and then here we go again. So please don't have plan any, any, I've stopped planning any holidays or whatever for a long time after I've finished film because <laughs> these directors can strike you any time at you know, a special break. And, uh, but I just took a little, little break, one more, because you'll be your head, uh, just to, to finish on the light and note, uh, because this is, when I'm away from the, I just played a few minutes of the Red, red Dog, when uh, this is very different to others. It's a very simple score based on the main melody based on the basic uh, B, B minor, G, and D, and then goes to chord progression of uh, E, F sharp, B minor, and G. So it's sort of moving around the very simple course. Because like I said, if you start putting too, uh, too many nines, 13s, whatever, you, you lose this contemporary sound. That's my advice. You have to find in the simple chord voicing, no, in simple chord, the right voicing which makes contemporary stuff and add occasionally very more cluster type of notes. For example, I had examples of the, from the book of Revelations when I wrote very complex music. And the film was very complex. Unfortunately, uh, some critics, you know, the critics really didn't like that there was, they called it dissonant and, and so on. The film gave me some great satisfaction, but I tried to, to really push the boundaries a bit further and, uh, and uh, you know, like the cr film critics, you know, the, the, my, my peers, you know, the film critics really liked it and so on. But uh, for the general audience it was a bit too, too difficult because once you move into the very dissonant music, the people start, uh, People are used to do. So you have to find a way of sounding contemporary within sort of, that's my, my theory, maybe I'm wrong, within sometimes quite simple chord progression, but surprised by the, 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 the voicing and the sound. So I'll run out of time, yes, to show this right now. How long is the clip? Well, this long, but I can play a few minutes. Just show you that it just lacks in how simple it is. If you want to yeah. yeah. You know, it's nothing better than the, the dog in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a bad thing about it. I just heard a few days ago on IQ, on this English show, that actually each dog consumed is the worst for ecology, equal bad to ecology is Toyota Land Cruiser, as far as consuming the, so much food. <laughs> so, I'm really um, impressed. I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd especially like to thank Opera and the Screen Composers Guild for sponsoring this session and Cesare for coming all the way from Australia to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much.